Welcome to EJB Talks, Rutgers Blaustein School Experts in Policy, Planning, and Health, where we talk with our faculty and staff experts, as well as students, about how the fields of public policy, urban planning, public health, health administration, and public and urban informatics affect your lives. Welcome to the fifth season of EJB Talks. I'm Stuart Shapira, the Associate Dean of Faculty at the Blaustein School, and the purpose of this podcast, as always, is to highlight the work of my colleagues and our alumni in the fields of policy, planning, and health, and what they are doing to make the world, the country, and New Jersey a better place. After last week's commemoration of September 11th on the podcast, this week we're going to start with the theme of the season. As the Blaustein School approaches its 30th anniversary next year, we're going to be talking to some of the faculty members who made it what it is today. The first of those is Professor Emeritus Frank Popper. He retired in 2020 after teaching in our world-ranked urban planning program for more than three decades. Frank, welcome to the podcast. Nice to, nice to be here. Thank you for asking. Like me, you are somewhat of an accidental academic. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to the Blaustein School? Yeah, uh, for most of the 1970s uh, and the beginning of the 80s, uh, I I was pretending to be in a consultant, a land use consultant, uh, environmental consultant uh, in Chicago, which is where I'm from, and then Washington, where we moved later later. basically because I, I, I had an offer from a, a very respectable uh, research, research op- operation uh, that I turned out not to fit in real well. Uh, and I, I, in truth, had never been anything more than, than a middling consultant. The, the, the money side of it in particular sort of, a sort of uh, it, it eluded me for the most part. And I wasn't that great on the intellectual uh, side of it also, <laughs> at least as far as intellectual, counted it, 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 in, in the consulting world. And it's getting to be the early 1980s, and I'm you know, getting a little bit older, and I have two children. And then there's Ronald Reagan in Washington, whose enthusiasm for land use and environmental stuff, and, and for, for consultants of my variety generally <laughs> for policy in general right, really. right. and that I, I at one point wrote a, a short piece which mercifully the washington post turned down about how, how 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 regan had sent this this guy in a trench coat named sam out to my backyard to look at my house behind the tree from behind the tree and, and, and Sam's notion was to, to tell the people in the White House what I was interested in, in and they would make sure not to fund it. Uh, and th- th- there were some odd years through there, but eventually some common sense, mainly, again, as you may have noticed in setting up this, uh, this, this, this podcast, it came from my wife. She suggested that I did, after all, have a PhD. I never actually used it. There was a reason I never actually used it. But maybe by ten years later or so, uh, the 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 reason I hadn't used it might have worn out its welcome. So I started applying to places uh, in in the planning world, and and what Rutgers bit, which was which was very nice of it, and I I spent you know. 36 and a half years there. Uh, sometimes I suspect you would know more about this than I would, uh, trying Rutgers patients. Uh, but on the, on the whole, they were very, very nice to me and allowed me to do, you know, the true academic freedom thing of researching that which was interesting. And uh, Blaustein really just insisted it have something to do with public policy. And, and certainly most of what I looked at while I was at Blasting, uh, yeah, certainly had public policy implications. But, you know, nobody was telling me you have to do something about New Jersey uh, or anything right. like that. And, you know, when I looked into what my real interests were, yeah, there was a certain amount of urban stuff, big city stuff that I eventually uh, ended up, up doing. But I, I, I started out basically looking at rural planning in part because, uh, well, you know, quite apart from my my job difficulties and Gus, who I think was the name of the guy Regan sent after me, uh, 
but I, I really thought that on, on the rural planning and particularly the frontier planning side of American land use and other countries' land use too, there was a lot to be done even to remotely catch up with what would, would being done for for big cities like, like New York or, or suburbs like Highland Park where you and I both live. You still do. Yeah, your, your, your path's a lot like mine, uh, you know, with time in Washington after getting a PhD, never really intending to become an academic. You can substitute George W. Bush uh, for Ronald Reagan in, in my case, um, although I never had anyone in my backyard, so there, there's well, a difference there's there. Well, Gus in my backyard with the trench coat and the funny look, I mean, he, he was entirely, as I say, in, in my imagination, and probably yes. if the Washington Post had published it, uh, I might have regretted it, and who knows? <laughs> I might not have ended up here or at Rutgers. That, that's right. Well, no, the, the the ball bounces in funny ways. Yes, yes, yes it certainly does. And, <laughs> and and any students listening to this should keep in mind the ball does bounce in ways you cannot predict. You will never imagine. You cannot <laughs> game or outwit or anything like that. You can only rebound perhaps badly i always say um i've never answered the question what are you going to be doing in five years correctly uh, so, yeah uh, yeah i i myself have yeah i yeah my brain fogs up when, when asked that and I, <laughs> i'm sure I've, I've blown some decent interviews over the years that i i'd rather not think about by my inability to to answer that question at all coherently. <laughs> well, that, that was to Blaustein's fortune. Um, the, uh, you talked about your interest in, in rural areas and, and in depopulation. Can you explain the, uh, the Buffalo Commons to our, our listeners? Sure. This is research that uh, basically I started in Washington uh, at a very respectable uh, uh, institution, Resources for the Future. Uh, which was not the place I originally went to uh, first in, in Washington from Chicago, from Chicago. Uh, but resources for the future, basically a semi-academic, they offered me a year's uh, pay, uh, every year, a one year fellowship. Uh, and they were quite clear it wasn't going to continue beyond that. Uh, so I did spend a lot of that year looking around and eventually finding, finding Rutgers and having find me. And most of what I ended up doing there was looking at uh, the American West, in particular the underpopulated areas of the American West. And that's most of them, certainly mm -hmm. the rural, but the rural ones by any kind of Eastern or Midwestern standards worth them uh, are very lightly populated, never been much. And when I got to Rutgers, there was, uh, and again, this will be familiar to many of the listeners here, uh, the pressure to publish quickly, um, uh, something quick, fast, you know, doable. Uh, and I wanted to, instead of focusing on the American West, I wanted to focus on a particular region in the, the American West uh, that I, th I thought was interesting. And that my, my interest there, by the way, goes back to, driving across the country several times uh, from Chicago to uh, the West Coast, where, where I would spend the summer. I'd always be impressed by places like the Great Basin in Nevada, and especially the Great Plains farther east. Uh, and eventually, I focused at Rutgers on the Great Plains. By that time, my wife was in graduate school in geography. Uh, at Rutgers. And in the late 80s, we put together a short paper uh, that basically looked at the Great Plains area of the United States, which is about a fifth, a sixth maybe, of the lower 48. It starts in the middle of, or, or, or the eastern part of states like Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas, goes all the way to the, the, the foothills of the Rockies. So there's a bunch of fair-sized cities at the edge of it, places like Denver and San Antonio and, and Oklahoma City. But the actual sixth of the United States, uh, and in, in those days, if I remember correctly, let's say sixth of the United States, had about approximately the population uh, 
of, of Georgia or Indiana, a middle-sized state at, at best. And when you get, went out to the, the really rural areas, places that actually had uh, names like, like Bison, South Dakota, and so forth, what you found is places that actually had their high population, like just before the Dust Bowl, say 1930 or 1920, or even just before or, or just after the first settlement of the area, which would basically go back to about 1890 so or so, and had been declining ever since. Uh, the farm economy was always very weak. There was very rarely much in addition to a farm economy. Young people uh, would go off to school or go off to the service or go off to work, and they could never find, for the most part, unless they happened to be lucky enough to be the children of the large ranchers in the area, that much to do in the area, uh, you know, the county, right. the town, even, or whatever. And, and these were places uh, that, as I say, had been losing population. We were writing in the late 80s, so they'd been losing population for at least half a century, probably more. There wasn't much in the way of, as I say, opportunities for young people. And uh, you would... The, the, these were places that already a generation or, or more ago would have things like median ages like <laughs> 57. Wow. When right, 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 right now we are worried that the median age of the United States uh, is has risen to something like 38 or 39 or so right. in the latest sense. But, you know, an entire county whose median age is 57. And... We, we looked a lot into the history of, of the place, and we, we did interview a lot of people when we were out there car camping with our kids in 1985, which was two years after I, I got to Rutgers. Uh, and we came back and we started to write, we wrote, we wrote a very long paper, something like 52 pages mm -hmm. for academia. You know, it, it's too long for an article, way too short for a book, right. and we kind of stuck in between. Um, and... Uh, I started peddling it around to some people, and we we had done it basically. I would have to say, uh, to be married, it was an intellectual exercise. My wife, the new graduate student, right? You know, we would we would we would do stuff together, uh, and that's what this paper was mm -hmm. about. And of course, initially, naturally, we were having trouble uh, publishing it because you know it felt too good, or was too long, or you know something right. like it felt too good to right. do it, or was too long, or whatever. Uh, and eventually, I uh, called up some people at the American uh, Planning Association, which was my first real planning uh, job. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's always been located primarily in Chicago. It's the main organization of American city planners. Uh, has something like, well, these days has something like 40,000 members. Uh, it's not a particularly academic organization. There's a separate planning academic organization uh, called the American uh, Collegiate Schools of Planning, much smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and I talked to the people at uh, who edited the planning or the American Planning Association's magazine, not its academic journal, its magazine, and. They sort of liked the idea, I think, because they would hardly ever run anything rural to speak of. Uh, they, too, had a sense, you know, American planning is you know, all urban and especially these days suburban. That was already beginning to happen in the late 1980s. Uh, and they did this absolutely terrific job with the piece, boiling it down from, I, I forget, 52 pages mm -hmm. to, I believe it was something like 14. They found some... Fabulous graphics, 1930s photographs, and what did the same people look like today? Uh -huh. uh, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a footnote in it. Uh, there were some very, very mild bibliography that, that you know, uh, people down the hall from you, I think, would snoop. Uh -huh. But that's okay. Uh, and basically, it ended up being a very nice piece of journalism that about the future of the Great Plains. And what we came up with was the notion that, and this was, as I say, going on in the late 80s, uh, all kinds of things like American diets changing away from the beef that the, uh, the planes produced to, uh, uh, to, to things like chicken and, and, and vegetables, which for the most part the planes did not, or things like uh, 
uh, the, the, the American military uh, was basically uh, closing a lot of the missile bases in the northern part of the mm-hmm. United States that were were aimed at, at Russia, not not because uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed yet, although it was about to, but because they were just too expensive to get the military doctrine and so forth. Uh, so again, the what we what we saw was a, a continued decline in the plains population, uh, and this was actually would be the third the Dust Bowl was the well known one. There was another one that had occurred in the eighteen nineties that had been particularly nasty too. Uh, and we needed an ending for the paper, uh, which we struggled with for a long time. And then finally, uh, we came up with the notion that eventually much of the planes, and we were very clear, much of the planes, not all of it, we weren't estimating amounts, anything like that, might become, might return to a giant national park, maybe the biggest, certainly in, in the lower 48, and whose theme would be the recovery of the Great Plains as 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 it was before the whites showed up and took it from the Indians. Right. And we called this uh, this vision of ours, which is really just something we made up in, in the car while stuck on the New Jersey turnpike in bad <laughs> Not weather. Not in the middle of Kansas in, or any place like that, but on the New Jersey yeah, turnpike. Right, right. No, we were, stuck, we were stuck in the car in front of, in fact, the Bayway Refiner, <laughs> uh, uh, which at the time was supposedly the most polluting facility in the country. Uh, and, you know, we started thinking, you know, this is a version of the tragedy of the commons, a continental version of tragedy, the commons with Buffalo. And suddenly we came up with the term Buffalo. And that's what we used to end it. And that was our notion of, you know, where we saw the planes going uh, through a whole series of accidents that, again, are the way the ball bounces Mm -hmm. and had nothing to do with us. Uh, And this exploded, uh, right? I mean, this became a very big deal. No, this became a very big thing. Uh, the the governor of North Dakota in particular, who I, I later met, very decent guy, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and and all that. Uh, he was very bothered. Uh, he thought this sort of did not take a, did not appreciate the state of North Dakota's historic role, at least in the white period, <laughs> uh, post Indian period. Uh, as largely the granary of the United States. You know, this is where all the wheat and a lot of the cotton, a lot of the cattle came mm-hmm. from at the time. They were already shifting away, both to other parts of the country and abroad. I mean, particularly things like wheat uh, and so forth. Uh, but yeah, it exploded fast. Uh, we've published this in December 87. And I think by the middle of 1990, the New York Times ran a long article in the Sunday Times about it. And we were told later uh, that we'd barely beaten out for the cover uh, by the leading North Vietnamese general who had actually won the war for the, for, <laughs> for, for, the, uh, for what is now Vietnam. Uh, and uh, there's ever since, it, it, it proved that it had been going on you know, also 88, 89, and continued basically uh, until about 2005 or so. This was not 15 minutes of fame. This was many years. Yeah. Uh, and, and and until about 2005, when we could count on being in the planes, say, five times a year, often talking to audiences that were not entirely happy with us uh, and that were quite vocal about expressing their their dislike of us and the, of the Buffalo Commons. And we kept telling them, and it was actually true. It was Deborah's idea. Uh, she found tactful ways to put it, more, more <laughs> tactful than, than I would. That what we were all engaged in, include the angry crowds, and, and you know, sometimes they actually were quite dangerous. Uh, although yeah. I never wanted to go into the details of it. It won't go in, in here. Uh, but what... what what the planes had, what we were doing with the planes uh, was a giant planning exercise for a co- part of the country that didn't really do much in the way of Blaustein style zoning planning or comprehensive any, planning, uh... or much environmental planning, because, and, and this was a well long held local conviction 
uh, that I really couldn't argue with, that people like farmers and ranchers and large landowners there uh, were actually doing perfectly good environmental conservation things as a result of the Dust Bowl, had been doing them year after year quite well, except they had no explanation for why their kids kept losing mm-hmm. and why the economy kept, kept, kept shrinking and why the main streets of the towns uh, looked, looked so sort of dusty and blown around and why no, no new industries of any kind could be attracted at all. And basically what we had done, um, which probably could only be done by outsiders, couldn't have been done, for example, if we had been teaching at, let's say, the University of Colorado, the University of mm-hmm. Montana, the University of Texas. Uh, what we had done was, was point out, shall we say, uh, well, what Al Gore later called, you know, you know, he's right in, in his terms, too, an inconvenient truth about climate change. Mm-hmm. And we pointed out this inconvenient truth about what was happening, what had happened historically to the Great Plains, and the Buffalo Commons offered a sort of plan B for the economy, very different from the plan A, very much using uh, you know, the, the, the native culture and the native economies and the Native American cultures of the area as a way to... Uh, to at least revive the economy. And in, in truth, in the 30 plus years since, since 1987, um, lots and lots of signs like this have shown up that actually, in their way, justify or confirm, if you will, the hypothesis. Yeah, let's, the let's touch on that. I mean, we just had a census results come out. Um, we've just gone through or continuing to go through a global pandemic. Um, what are you seeing in these areas that, that confirms what you uh, thought 35 years ago? Oh, the, the, these places that, that were always uh, declining have basically kept declining. I haven't looked at the median ages uh, of these areas, mm-hmm. but again, they're likely to go up. Uh, the racial problem of, of the Great Plains historically, and a lot of the rural West, uh, has historically mm-hmm. not been black, white, but Indian white. And uh, Indians, uh, Native Americans, have much lower median ages. They and the, the new uh, Latinx populations that have been showing up in the Great Plains since uh, we started we started writing. Mm-hmm. Those are the only two groups that are growing in terms of 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 uh, of, of you know you know reproduction and so forth. Uh, immigrants don't, on the most, for the most part, well, there are some exceptions, don't seem to be attracted there at all on, uh, you know, for their own perfectly good reasons. There really isn't that much yeah. for them to go to, uh, you know, especially if there's no particular background in farming. Um, and um, the ages keep going up. Uh, the Indian population in particular keeps growing uh, they're all for the Buffalo Commons. They've undertaken. They've they've really widened their particular their buffalo mm-hmm. herds, their buffalo culture, their marketing of buffalo culture to whites, which has been very successful in in lots of ways. There are a lot of white ranchers that have sw- switched from cattle or from farming uh, into buffalo. The buffalo population of the United States is far larger. Uh, than it was in, in 1987, maybe as much as three times as large as, as it was all those years ago. This, by the way, is for an animal that takes often over a year uh, to gestate. Uh, so, you know, reproducing them is, is a major investment, uh, you know, if you're trying to do so. The herds on the various public lands, places like the, the various national parks, in the area, they've grown in, in a big way. Uh, there's all kinds of ways in which parts of the economy that aren't strictly speaking tied to Buffalo, but have this kind of, uh, you know, look at the land, live more widely at the land, you know, drop the human presence and so forth. Things like, you know, particular kinds of seeds uh, from particular kind of plants uh, have also grown in a big way. Uh, basically, I mean, for a piece of social science prophecy, uh, 
you know, holding up over a generation or more. The, the Buffalo Commons has not done badly uh, at all. And in fact, it's still growing in lots of ways. Uh, we've, we, 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 as I say, are not as present in the plains as, as we used to be in, until maybe 15 years ago. Uh, but, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, film, academia, books, even music, uh, that, that basically uh, you know, takes off from the Buffalo Commons and goes somewhere with it. And sometimes we get credited and sometimes we don't. And it's the kind of thing where if we don't, it's like our kid has grown up, doesn't, doesn't need to acknowledge us anymore. You, know, you, turn, <laughs> you turn into Stuart's father and so forth. So is there more attention now towards planning when we think about these communities or is it still sort of very ad hoc waiting for uh, people like yourself? It, 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 it's very ad hoc. When, when, when we were going there in a big way, the big radical candidate of the area mm-hmm. uh, was Ross Perot. And now, and it has been you know, for the last five mm-hmm. years or so, it's much more Trump. Uh, neither of these people are, 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 are people who would be especially enthused about the sort of Blaustein school type planning or public policy analysis in general, Trump more so. Uh, I, in fact, you know, maybe I'm older and more responsible, or Deborah and I are older and more responsible. If we got invited to talk to the plane, to talk in the planes, I'm not mm-hmm. sure we'd accept quite so quickly unless. We got more guarantees of safety, and and we did. In fact, lots of people. You know, there were lots of people. We we made appearances in the nineteen nineties, early two thousands, where they told us afterwards there were police all over the place, including <laughs> police they borrowed from from, from nearby counties because there's not that big a police presence <laughs> in that part of the the state or, or in, in that part of the world because the area is more rural. It's usually state police, plenty of state police there. Looking back on your career, what are you uh, what are you most proud of your your time uh, as an academic at at Blasting? Well, the Buffalo Commons certainly worked real well, and and there's lots of stuff still coming out. Uh, Ken Burns is supposedly oh, doing wow. a, a movie about Buffalo, yeah. and you know I'm ex- and, and 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 his key assistant is somebody who has actually written a lot about our work already. Went to one went uh, went to. Uh, so we're expecting a phone call about that sometime, although, you know, he, he may decide to take a more purely historical approach, in which case I'd understand that passing, you know, on, on our kind of futurism, if they, that's the way it works. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. And then another thing that, um, you know, we don't usually talk about in academia is, is our, you know, what our students have gone off and done, not just the two or three favorite ones, you know, which we always talk about, but. Uh, I mean, there's there, there, there's all kinds of people. I, I taught, uh, uh, you may remember, a lot outside the Blaustein School. And there's certainly people like, uh, you know, Justin Hollander at Tufts, who, you know, particularly likes Tufts because he went to Tufts as an undergraduate, who's doing real well in the academic planning world. But there's uh, a, a, a woman, for example, uh, Jane... In Rosenblatt, who uh, much younger, I think, than, than Justin, she's, uh, I believe, chief of staff at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Well, that's great, and I think we probably could go on a lot longer. There are a lot of areas we haven't touched, but I think we probably should wrap up here. Well, uh, thank you for for inviting me. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, first. Also, I, I, I gather. <laughs> Uh, the retirees and and thank you also and to thank Amy for bearing with Deborah and me while uh, you know I tried to get up to maybe you know 2005 computer <laughs> uh, yeah no well thank you for coming on and as always as Frank just did I'm going to thank Amy and Karen for their help in putting the podcast together um, we'll be back uh, next week with another guest uh, another uh, retiring or retired faculty member and until then stay safe <laughs>